I discovered the pub, this public uh, when I was in Tokyo a uh, long time ago and I thought this fabric was very really beautiful and unusual because uh, it's such a new fabric so uh, there's uh, uh, so much things that you don't really know about or you always discover uh, but uh, um, it's a, uh, I like challenge and I think it's worth it. I think in the right hands now, a lot of designers have realised that latex is now something way beyond just black shiny stuff. Mm. One thing we noticed maybe five, six, seven years ago, a lot of stylists started picking up on using gloves and stockings in particular mm. to decorate the arms and legs. And that was the kind of start of this fashion thing. And it's still there really strongly because if you want to make a girl's legs just look the same shape but shiny and purple, you go to latex straight away because latex is the fabric that is most like skin. So it's like you can paint the skin with the fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, it holds you in like a second skin and it's kind of empowering, feels, becomes like a superwoman for me. <gasps> <laughs> John Sutcliffe was the guy that had a very famous label called Atomage, which was the first label making latex clothing for anything other than a utilitarian purpose. John Sutcliffe was actually taking a girlfriend for a ride on his motorbike in like the 1950s and it rained heavily and she got soaked and afterwards he came home and decided to make her something that would, so she wouldn't get wet when she was riding pillion. And so he stitched together, I think it probably was leather, and made her like effectively like the first kind of leather catsuit. This catsuit became the kind of prototype fetish item. And in the early 70s, critically, um, Westwood and McLaren picked up on what he was doing and started making clothes from rubber for the first time as a kind of fashion fetish item. But they took it that big leap further that we all kind of know about with the sex shop and with punk, and punk using fetish as a big iconographic shock tactic. And by 76, it was like thrown into the mainstream. And now fetish has become where we all are now, which is massively different and massively more varied so much so that show studio have this whole series on it and are doing this amazing exploration of it so for us that's why we wanted to reference that uh, because there's a very very strong chain of events it seems like it's got an evolution to go more and more overground. I mean the most common fetish item is high heels. I mean who could have imagined that beautiful heels like these Nicholas Kirkwood ones would be anything other than a fetish item. In other words that, that they would be both a luxury item um, and in many forms also a high street item. We, we sell many less shoes than we used to because Quite frankly, every shop sells high heels. So now we have to sell even more extreme ones like the ballet boots and plug pump boots, which are like a butt plug on a heel and all this kind of really more extreme kinky stuff. We can sell that, but we cannot compete with endless shops that sell regular high Super heels. High heels. Yeah. Which is, we're not complaining because... It's great. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the corset as an item is second behind high heels in mm. that march. Um, because you can pretty much buy a corset in almost any town now, whereas before it was probably, you know, a few specialised kind of mail order places. But it shows, that fact about high heels shows that the masses are prepared to get involved in a fetish. Um, because every woman who wears high heels is preferred, or, and men too, are prepared to put up with a certain amount of pain for quite a lot of gain. And the gain is the elegance of the leg, the posture, the glamour, all of those things. But those things could equally be applied to a latex glove.
Lady Gaga, we did, um, for the Marry the Night video, oh, we made identical. six identical ballerina outfits mm. in latex, and all of the tutus, there were six of them, fluffy. Were, had to be kind of fluffy and real and yet made from latex, so it was like making so six <laughs> gigantic latex souffles was what it was like. <laughs> and it took so long. It mm. was incredibly time consuming. I mean, it's always like a, a, a massive challenge because she challenges with what she asks people to do. But each of those skirts had a hundred uh, latex tubes that we handmade each tube. So there were 600 for the six outfits. Um, and each of those tubes took you know, quite a while. Um, to, to kind of construct so that they made this, um, these tutus that actually had the effect of, of, of very light fabric tutus that you see in proper ballet, and yet they were all made of latex, so it, it was such a challenge. Um, and it does look amazing in the video. <laughs> um, and now getting the hand in and getting the fingers located is the hardest part, as you can see. It's very organic fabric, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but it actually, as we've already found today, responds to liquids and, and light and all of those kind of things in a, like skin would. You know, it kind of gets marked and bruised and, and sometimes you can see through it more and sometimes less and, and it never is the same twice. It's not like a very uniform kind of fabric because it's made from, it just comes out of a tree. It's rubber tree liquid, that is what it is, you know, kind of rolled out into a sheet. And um, <clears throat> so it has all this kind of weirdness that goes on with it um, and responding to all those different chemicals and, and that are either in the environment or artificial chemicals um, or chemicals uh, from the skin, um, from the human skin, you know, uh, react to it differently. For people, as uh, I said before, latex is like a second skin. You need to put moisturizer, otherwise it gets dry. The latex reacts to differently too. So uh, sometimes you have to kind of adapt to, to make it perfect. So uh, even uh, if I was working on a pattern and uh, sometimes with fitting and I have to um, take, take some uh, change uh, to, to kind of make it work. <laughs> We're going to attempt um, a latex manicure. Latex manicure has probably never been attempted before. <laughs> we did, um, it was a one-off outfit. It ended up being bought by quite a famous film director. It's like a kind of cod piece for a man um, in the shape of the front half of a dachshund <laughs> with little ears and a face. And the dog had a lead around its neck and the lead was held by the lady doggy walker. So that the pecking order in this <laughs> Uh, situation was lady, dog, man. What's so bizarre is because, despite how specialised the clothing and the label is, our client base feels like it's absolutely every type. I mean, age range has been almost limitless. We, we have gone up to and beyond 80 year olds, and, oh, wow. and we have. In, in the best possible way done outfits for people who are younger than 18 because you don't need to be 18 to wear this. There isn't always a sexual connotation with it. There's much more acceptance, as I said, uh, because of the fashion and the culture and the media and pop stars and the internet. Um, and then you've got the designers who are pushing the fabric as well. So all in all, it's, it's, that's why there's a big trend for it. I mean, you know, uh, because it's happening in all sorts of myriad kind of ways. I, th I think it's an evolutionary thing that, that the fetishism is an evolution. Maybe latex gloves or corsetry or 
latex bras, why would they not make that same journey that high heels have made? Um, only time is going to tell, really.